Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Kylo. I'm a Lutheran pastor, have been for about 29 years now, and I'm also the executive director of Paths to Understanding. For the last four years, Paths to Understanding and Holden Village have been sponsoring Interfaith Week at Holden. And this year, due to COVID-19, of course, we're all sad that we can't be together, but we wanted to produce a full week of programming. Um, and uh, we invite you to, to be a part of it, and we're so thankful uh, to have you joining us. And we're thankful to Holden Village for working with us on this week. So our, our Muslim and Jewish neighbors are going to be sharing an introduction to Judaism and Islam. And so we thought it was only fair that we should attempt to do an introduction to Christianity in about an hour, um, as they're attempting to do. Of course, we're not trying to share a introduction to Christianity from like some sort of historical overview perspective, but rather kind of a take on Christianity. Uh, given all the input that we've had from 20,000 biblical scholars and, and from the social sciences, as well as theologians. And, and so I thought I just would share with you, you know, sort of my vision or my, what I've learned really about Christianity in, in the last uh, 29 years as a pastor, um, and also um, uh, in my 55 years of being uh, a Christian. So I just want to uh, share this with you and, and, uh, and know that it's just my take and that if you disagree, hey, that's okay. Um, let's, let's, let's be okay with that. But I want to start off with my own story a little bit. So I grew up in a small town in Eastern Washington State. It was a really great little congregation, uh, mostly uh, Norwegian when I started growing up. Um, and uh, wheat farmers, a lot of them. And uh, I would look up at this paint, at this uh, stained glass window here. Um, of Jesus uh, having found the lost lamb, the lost sheep. And I could, of course, imagine that I was that lost sheep and that for Jesus, there's no acceptable losses, uh, that, that he will come out and find, find you. And, uh, and I felt very much found in that congregation by the love of God. And I'm very grateful for that. But the story of my families, um, I have part of my family, my dad's side, uh, came from Norway, and part of my my family story is a little more complicated than that, um, and it really begins in the middle of the 15th century, um, as my family were Moors in Spain uh, uh, on my mother's side. In fact, my 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 mother's maiden name was Morash, and so uh, the Moors uh, ruled Spain for a very long time and actually had great relationships with the Christians and the Jews there. Um, led a pretty equitable society in many respects. Um, and, but in the middle of the 15th century, um, it was decided by some of the Christian uh, princes and, and kings there that they wanted to conquer the Moorish parts of Spain. And, uh, and so they went to Pope Nicholas V and they said, look, we want some divine sanction for, for us to go and conquer them. And so there was a papal bull put forth by, by again, Pope Nicholas in 1452 that read this. We grant you by these present documents with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture and subjugate the Saracens, that is the Muslim Moorish uh, folk, uh, my ancestors, and pagans and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they, they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. Uh, so this is a document from the church saying that because God had, uh, had become a human in Jesus, had appointed uh, Peter to be a leader and Christ's representative on earth, that therefore they had the authority to declare that Muslims and others who were not Christian could be subjugated, have their land stolen from them, and be reduced to perpetual servitude. Um, here's a, a, a painting, actually, of the fall of Granada. Um, and what you see on the left are some of the Moorish folk, my ancestors, uh, standing there, um, basically, um, you know, uh, giving in to, to the, the King, uh, King Isabella and King, King uh, Ferdinand, Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And, and this person that you see standing rather haughty uh, on the right is Christopher Columbus. 
And, uh, and so here's my ancestors uh, becoming, uh, because of that papal bull and because of the war that took place, becoming refugees and leaving uh, to go to southern Germany uh, to, to get out of there um, because they were unsafe. And uh, of course, this, uh, this was in 1492 that this happened. And, um, and very, very quickly, of course, uh, because of the money that, was, that, that, was, that they received because of this conquest, um, they actually sent uh, uh, Christopher Columbus to find a new route to India. And of course, you know, what he found was uh, parts of the Bahamas. And here's a painting of, of him landing. And you can see um, on the left, we have a, a priest um, with, with uh, some of the indigenous folk on the left there, sort of in a, in a bit of a gloom. And, uh, and you see Christopher Columbus with a sword in one hand looking heavenward, um, as if to say that his act of conquering these islands was itself a form of prayer. Um, and there were in fact other papal bulls which altogether are called the doctrines of discovery. So there was a, a kind of a policy on behalf of European kings that they wanted to invade and conquer and colonize lands that were occupied by, by folk who were not Christian. And then there was kind of a doctrine of discovery that sort of gave divine sanction or divine blessing to that conquering. And here we see a depiction of this, of this both kind of all happening at, at one time, a conquering of people, but also sort of a, a, a claim that God had, um, had, had okayed this. Um, and of course we know from history that Christopher Columbus and others on subsequent trips um, really did some horrific things. And I, I hate to show this photo because it's just absolutely terrible. Um, but it is a, a, a depiction of what uh, some of what they did to the indigenous peoples. It's important to note that uh, that historians and, and sociologists, when they look at the invasion of of North and South uh, and Central America, say that probably ninety five percent of all indigenous people were murdered, one way or another, or died one way or another. And of course. Um, this is where you know some of my own family uh, kind of comes back around because my my grandfather left Norway um, uh, you know around eighteen seventy or so um, and on a, and came to America from Norway on an eighteen foot wooden boat with twelve other people, which obviously took a tremendous amount of courage. Uh, but what happened is that he received land. Uh, he received about 600 acres of land. And because he was white and Christian and had farming uh, skill, he was able to improve the land for farming. He was able to get that land free. Of course, it wasn't free. It was in fact taken from indigenous peoples in Washington state. And so what we have on the screen now is sort of a, a, a painting by John Gast from 1872 uh, depicting sort of this this theft and this this transition of land from from indigenous peoples uh, to to white settlers, and so what we see on the left are the buffalo and the bear um, and the coyotes sort of being pushed off to the side along with the indigenous human beings, and on the on the right what you see are are cities and light and um, and farming. Um, only thing missing from this painting perhaps is churches. And who's that in the middle? Um, this, it's not, uh, I, trust me, a, a floating uh, Comcast repair person uh, bringing cable to everyone. Um, that is Columbia, um, sort of a, a demigod dreamed up, uh, named after Christopher Columbus, who was uh, bringing an education book uh, along with her uh, out from the, the east to the west and uh, talking about manifest destiny and, and symbolizing the right of white folk to steal land from indigenous peoples and to farm it as their own. And of course, I benefited therefore from this. So not only was my family in the 15th century uh, become refugees 
due to the doctrines of discovery and the actions of some European uh, kings and queens. Uh, but my family also benefited from it. And so did the people in my home church benefit from it. Uh, the land that, uh, that that church was on was once belonged to the Palouse peoples. Um, who, uh, who roamed all those beautiful rolling hills in the Palouse country of Eastern Washington State. And, uh, and I think it's important to state that when you benefit, when we benefit from the subjugation or oppression of other people, we can tend to dehumanize them. We tend to want to hate them because it's hard for us to consider that perhaps we've benefited from the oppression of other people. And so I remember very clearly, you know, leaving church sometimes where we would sing in Sunday school, Jesus loves the little children of the world, all the children of the world. And then I would go out as a young man and hear the men talk in the parking lot, sometimes using racial, racial epithets uh, and speaking very derisively of other people. And, uh, and so the Christianity I grew up in was very beautiful. It taught me a great deal. But there's something about it that we've got to reflect on, I think. Because after all, Jesus was, was not a white person. <laughs> um, Jesus was a Mediterranean brown-skinned person. And of course, it's perfectly appropriate for, for people uh, to reflect on Jesus as <clears throat> a Scandinavian, as long as we're also aware of and centering on the idea that, that Jesus uh, comes to people of all cultures. And... Uh, and, and I think it's really important for us to work on that. So, so first of all, let's, let's talk next about sort of what civilization is, the promise of it, and some of the challenges of it. So um, one of the, the, the recent uh, archaeological finds is Gobitekli Tepe, um, which is in Turkey. And uh, what they have sort of found here in this, in this site is something rather startling. Um, and, and it sort of puts on its head some assumptions about hu how human civilization came together. Because one theory is that human civilization comes together because people started to do farming. And then they began to eventually work on shared language and shared stories and shared meaning. But it, it may have happened that way, but it may have happened the other way too. Uh, that sometimes the human need for meaning uh, because as Jesus says, we do not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need meaning as much as we need bread, in other words. We need it so badly that, that, we, that, that in this location, people came together, it seems, to have a shared story, to have shared meaning, and, uh, and to have shared symbols. Um, because somehow when we're together, when we share meaning together, um, we can feel... Um, much more strong in that sense of meaning. We, 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 we receive it in a, in a deeper kind of way. And when we kind of waver a little bit, our, our neighbor can, can help us, you know, to, to continue in that kind of like understanding of meaning of, what, of, of our own lives. And so, and so what appears to have happened here is that people first gathered for meaning and then later figured out how to do farming so they could stay close. Uh, to this sort of center of meaning. And so here's the reason why we need it so badly, of course, is that human beings are mortal, and we know we're mortal. And that's a, a weight of consciousness that is really, really powerful for us. And so we, we need meaning to kind of, uh, in our shared meaning, to kind of help us uh, grapple with, with what does life mean, even though one day life will end? And how do we bear that? And, and so we look to each other and to our common culture, to our common civilization, to offer us meaning. And of course, that's lovely and beautiful, but it can also be a problem. Some of the problems of civilization are that we can derive collective meaning from maladaptive stories. In other words, from stories that don't work for everyone. We can fall short of our aspirational values, but because we need meaning so badly, we kind of deny that we're falling short. We can claim that the stories themselves are ultimate. Uh, and basically in the Abrahamic traditions, of course, this is called idolatry. Now, one of these maladaptive stories that many people gave themselves to was this. This is a beautiful illustration by Dan Erlander. And this is an illustration of Pharaoh's Egypt. 
that there's a god figure and the sun god Ray who blesses the pharaoh who's like the son of the god Ray or related to the god Ray or blessed by the god Ray who then um, who then runs a system in which uh, there's priests on one side saying this is the way it is because the gods have ordained it and the military or the police saying and this is the way it will always be and if you don't uh, if you don't fall in line uh, bad things will happen to you and then there's a few people who benefit from this system but most people were enslaved vast majority of folk did not benefit from this system and yet they found meaning in it and so really what was happening here was that the god figure um, that the divine was was it was claimed was giving divine sanction or blessing to a system which in fact enslaved people now this is called the domination system and that same system essentially happened in babylon and the same system in fact happened in rome so when jesus begins to say the kingdom of god has come near repent and believe in the good news well the kingdom that the kingdom of god was replacing was the kingdom of rome was a system of domination in which most people do not benefit, in which only a few do. Because even Augustus Caesar was claimed to be the son of the god Apollo. And so, um, therefore, kind of claiming divine sanction or divine blessing for basically exploiting the, the colonies where Jesus, um, where Jesus lived and the colonies all over the Mediterranean world that the Romans had and benefited from. So there is a, an alternative, of course, to the kingdom of domination. And, uh, and before I get to that, I just want to say a few more things. So the, the kingdom of domination really says that what it means to be human is to have power, and explicitly to have power over other people. That's what it means to be human. And if you can't have a lot of power over other people, then at least you want to have power with the powerful. <laughs> You want to be part of a nation that's going to win, that's going to succeed, that's going to be strong, that's going to be great. And, and that essentially is, is part of the meaning system. That's the core of it. Um, but there's another way that I think is put out in, in, this, in the scripture very consistently, actually, um, is what, what I would call God's way of mutuality, what in the Christian scriptures is called the, the kingdom of God. And what is this way? Well, it is it is, a, a, uh, it is God's love, grace, and shalom in everyday life, in every aspect of human relationship, public, private, economic, political, personal, communal, body, mind, and environment. And if we were to depict the, the reign of God or God's way of mutuality, it might look something like this. It might look like an open circle uh, in, which, uh, in which people are able able to come in and go, um, which has kind of an organic quality to it, in which all kinds of different folk are included and gathered as they're, as they're able to, to join. And so God's way of mutuality has a very different sense of it, that, that to be human is not to have power over other people, but rather to have power with others. Um, and that that's what it means to be human, so that when we relate to each other, we, we do so on the basis of mutuality and equality and mutual respect, uh, remembering that we're all made in the image of God, no matter how we may look or what our appearance may be or what our abilities might be um, or any other difference that we might have. And so this, I think, is what Jesus is speaking about when he talks about God's kingdom coming near and that it was time to change our ways and believe that this kind of world, this kind of society could be built. And when he does this, he is quite literally not making it up for the first time. <laughs> um, actually, um, this whole thing began long ago. Uh, in Genesis 12, uh, it is, it's written that the Lord says to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This passage basically reveals not just the, the core value of the Abrahamic tradition, but actually kind of the mission statement of God in the world, and the core values of God, 
which is that God wants to be a blessing to all the families of the world. And those families or nations or cultures, which uh, the, the Hebrew includes all of those things, um, are to be blessed by God and therefore are to be blessed by people who are, who are part of God's family. Um, now, there is this thing in here about, I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And this is likely um, really about um, recognizing that in those days, there was no nation state, no police forces. And that's kind of a liturgy, it seems, um, of joining someone's family. You're going to protect each other, and you're going to, uh, to um, work for each other's mutual safety and benefit. And so don't get too distracted by that. The core value of God, and the, therefore the core value of those who follow in the Abrahamic tradition, is to be a blessing to all the nations of the world to all the cultures, to all the families. And this is really summarized, of course, in our tradition this way, uh, to love God more than our tribe or tradition and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, about five years ago, I, I began uh, a journey toward uh, working to support our Muslim neighbors because of all the hatred and bigotry that anti-Muslim hate groups and, and others in our country really gin up and, and try, to, try to strengthen. And so I would go to congregations and I would say that the Abrahamic tradition teaches to love God and to love our neighbors we love ourselves. But what I began to realize as I, as I taught that, as I engaged in conversation with congregations about it, was that when I said love God, it's like they thought that I loved our God. Um, and and uh, as if there's more than one creator. There may be different views, but there's not more than one creator. And so I began to think, you know, really deeply and for a long time about, about how, um, how I could be more clear. And so what I came up with is to love God more than our tribe and tradition. It's okay to have a tribe and it's okay to have a tradition. Those are very good things. But we have to love the God, as Paul Tillich said, beyond our idea of God, more than we love our idea of God, more than we love our tribe, more than we love our tradition. And, uh, and so that's, I, I think that's really, really the, the, the core of the Abrahamic tradition here. And part of the Abrahamic tradition um, the, is, is the whole idea of monotheism. That is that there is one creator for all human beings, uh, for all plants, for the entire created uh, un universe. And what that's intended to do is kind of counteract um, something that was quite common, actually, and that we still see today. Um, even in some Christian expressions, which is that we have our God, they have their God, and when we fight, our gods are, are fighting their gods, and, and the God who's the biggest wins, um, and the strongest wins. And, and of course, th what that means is that violence and conflict are kind of baked into the universe, and they're also kind of sacred. They're kind of holy in a way. And, and I don't think that's what monotheism is trying to say. Monotheism is trying to say something very different. That, that when we get into a conflict with another tribe or with some other people, um, there is not, you know, gods fighting up in the heavens along with us. There's actually one creator uh, saying, stop fighting because you're third cousins. In other words, monotheism was intended to help us recognize the humanity and our common humanity with other people. And of course, love your neighbor as you love ourselves. We know uh, from New Testament scholars that the word love here does not have much to do with emotion. Uh, love means to work for the well-being of our neighbor. So it doesn't matter how like, passionate we are in terms of loving our neighbor. What matters is are we actually working for their well-being and for our mutual well-being together. So let's talk about Jesus now. So Jesus uh, uh, grew up in Nazareth, um, overseeing this 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 valley uh, here here, um, and this is a a picture taken from from Megiddo, from a uh, from an archaeological site, kind of a fortress that oversaw the trade routes. Um, and there, up on the hill, kind of a little bit on the left, is is Nazareth, um, and Jesus uh, and his dad uh, would have at one point their family would have had farmland down below, a small plot of land. Um, as they, as most people were subsistence farmers. But what the Romans did when they came in and conquered uh, Palestine, as they did everywhere else, 
is they sort of set the taxation rate at just above the, the annual kind of income rate from the farm. Uh, and so they, they, they set it in just such a, a way that slowly people would get into taxation problems and, and debt. And so their land would be taken from them. And so by the time Jesus uh, was, uh, was uh, ready to become, a, recognized as an adult male, um, almost all the land in Galilee had been taken from all these, all these families. In fact, uh, it's, it, it's said that uh, by Marcus Borg that, that by the time Jesus was a teenager, three people owned all the land in Galilee. And so his dad, a village tinkerer, you know, may have worked on, on, th on farms sometimes for these, these Roman uh, landlords. Um, he may also have gone up the hill and worked on the, the Greco-Roman town of Sepphoris, which was being developed. Um, but in any case, uh, Jesus experienced a community where, where the Romans uh, had decided that they had divine sanction to conquer other people, to take their stuff from them, um, essentially use their labor to enrich themselves. And, uh, and, and that's a terrible situation, especially, um, especially with a religion that was based on, on freedom from slavery. Um, and now they were sort of enslaved. As, as Marcus Borg, uh, or excuse me, as Bishop N.T. Wright says, that in, the, in Jesus' first century context, it was as if the Babylonian Empire had come to Palestine. It was an exile at home, as he says. And so what Jesus begins to do as he um, begins his ministry is, is to offer a very different vision. So we have the baptism of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And it reads, And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And, and, you know, to us, this just sounds like God saying, hey, Jesus, I like you a lot. But actually, um, it's a lot more than that. Um, it really is a mashup of two different traditions um, from the Hebrew scripture and from sort of some common understandings in the first century. So you are my son is from Psalm 2. And it is a coronation psalm. So it would have been offered, uh, you know, as, a, as part of the coronation of a king. Of, of Israel. And so uh, this voice from heaven says that Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's an anointed one. Um, all kings were anointed, who was going to bring healing to the people of Israel after the Romans had conquered them and colonized them. And then the second part, the beloved with you, I'm well pleased, is from Isaiah 42, in which it's, it's, in which the, 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 the way people were going to get out of Babylon was through nonviolent resistance by claiming that, that they were God's, uh, God's made in the image of God and that they would, would remember who they were and, and remember that they weren't made to be slaves and, and would thus over time gain their freedom through that nonviolent resistance. And so what is happening here is that we have a mashup of two different traditions the Messiah that will come, and also uh, this sort of nonviolent resistance, sort of like Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., um, which, which can change a society. And so Jesus is the, the king, he's the Messiah, but he's a nonviolent public leader who, who then um, told disciples that they should take up their cross daily and follow me. Well, well what does that mean? Um, well, it means two things. First, it means that we're to remember every day that we're mortal. And to, to take that in just a little bit um, and recognize that in the midst of that mor 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 mortalness, that we are still beloved, that we're still good and very good, that we're still God's holy and beloved children. And to begin to put those together in such a way that we begin to need what civilization offers us a little bit less. We, if, if we're inside of a maladaptive story, if we're in a story that says that the gods bless the Romans or God, God blesses the Egyptians and the way that they um, enslave other people and lift up a system of domination, that if we can engage that a little bit, 
if we can gauge our belovedness in the midst of our mortality, if we, if we get our blessing and meaning directly from God, we don't need what culture offers us quite so much. We have a little more freedom. And in fact, Luther talked about this. He said that we should remember baptism as if death were near. So we kind of engage our mortality, and then we recognize that God loves us in the midst of all that, that God is with us in the midst of all that, and therefore gain a little bit of freedom, what I would like to call baptismal freedom. And, but it also means a second thing in Jesus' first century context, take up your cross daily and follow me. It also means that, uh, that, that, that uh, his followers are to be nonviolent revolutionaries along with Jesus. Because it, it must be said that, um, that the Romans uh, crucified something like 20,000 people a year, which meant they were really busy crucifying people. It was kind of its own industrial complex, uh, this crucifixion business. And the Romans would call people who were crucified thieves or, or whatever, but, uh, but really that was just uh, a part of the, of the, uh, the degradation of, of the society and of the person being killed. Um, people were, were crucified for being revolutionaries. And so what Jesus is saying is that in the midst of this Roman Empire, this, this, and I'm, I'm not being hard on Italians here, by the way, um, but in the midst of this Roman Empire, in the midst of this domination system, that we can be slightly more free in God's love when we sort of embrace our humanness, our mortality, our belovedness all at the same time, and begin to behave differently begin to play by a different tune. Jesus didn't want to win the game in first century Palestine. He wanted to change the game from a system of domination to God's way of mutuality. And so when, in fact, uh, Christians were, were baptized, they were, they were essentially given a new birth into a new world. As Paul says in Romans 4, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So we have died to a meaning system of domination, and we have arisen to a meaning system of mutuality. And of course, we all know what happened to Jesus. Uh, Jesus was engaged in this nonviolent public revolutionary leadership. Um, and he died. Um, the Roman Empire actually made sure that he died. And it must be, must be made very clear, of course, that the Roman Empire set the tone for all of that. There may have been some other bit players in that crucifixion, but it was the Roman Empire that actually crucified Jesus. And again, by that, I don't mean Italians. I mean, it was the empire as a system that did that. But Christians experienced Jesus as having been raised. Jesus was raised from the dead, which meant that the empire could do its worst. It could crucify Jesus. It could cause his disciples to, to, to stay in a, in a locked room for fear that they too would be rounded up and crucified. Um, they could feel that all their hope was gone. And yet Jesus was alive, and he appeared among them, and on the third day was raised from the dead. And what that meant was that, that the disciples could now engage in the kind of leadership they were called to, because they didn't have to depend on their meaning with being good, good Roman citizens or, or good subjects of the Roman Empire, but, but rather could live and lead in a much more free kind of way believing that God would have their back. Um, it also meant that, that they could engage in that without being quite so fearful of this tactic of, of imperial power of crucifixion. Because it kind of emptied the cross. It emptied this, this sort of public, in, intimidating, um, terror, terrorizing uh, way of death. It emptied of it so, some of its power. Uh, so that now they were able to to live uh, live out the the um, God's way of mutuality with a great deal of fear fearlessness, and uh, and so Jesus then is is beginning a kind of a movement here. He's not just the Messiah who's going to come and get it done, but rather he's beginning a a movement. And so there was a view, I think, among some people in the first century that the transition from domination to the reign of God would happen very abruptly. 
that, that there'd be a faithful remnant of people living God's way of mutuality amidst the kingdom of domination. And then there'd be kind of a hard break where the Messiah would come and raise an army and cast out the Romans, and then the kingdom of God would happen. And then part of that would be that the Messiah would bring resurrection to those who didn't get to experience God's way of mutuality before. Um, but I think the Christian scripture sort of gives a different picture. I think Mark's view is something more like this, that there's the kingdom of domination, there's the faithful remnant, and then the Messiah comes and he begins the healing, but the healing isn't completed actually until later, what we would call the second coming of Christ. And so what this means is that between the Messiah's arrival and whenever God makes the healing of the world complete, then we become kind of a messianic community. We become people who are empowered uh, to, to transform the empire from within through nonviolent resistance and engagement through public leadership. Um, and that Christ's promise, uh, Christ's resurrection is a kind of promise that God's going to complete that healing and that, and that God has our back. And so we can risk ourselves in love for neighbor and for ourselves, trusting that the resurrection will be there. We can live and lead with a kind of fearlessness, even though we are still going to experience fear because we are, after all, mortal beings. But being mortal beings, we are still beloved. And then we take a deep, deep breath at that moment, right? We are mortal. I will die. But I'm beloved in the midst of, of that. And I get my meaning directly from the God who loves me to be able to join God in God's mission of blessing all the families of the earth. So Jesus was a leader. Jesus loved God and himself and his neighbors and the earth through the practice of love in which he reorients people from domination culture to God's way of mutuality. Jesus is a leader. Now let's talk about love for a minute because love is again so often misunderstood as I said earlier. I say that in the New Testament and in the Hebrew scripture as a whole, uh, that love is risking oneself so that oneself and others may become who God is making us to be. We also, I think, misunderstand love sometimes to be mostly about how we care about ourselves or how we care about others. But in fact, it's much broader than that. So the practice of love, I think, that we see in the Christian scripture is intrapersonal, like so Jesus does care for himself. He takes time away to pray. Uh, he makes sure that uh, he has people around him who can, who can provide for food and that sort of thing. He does care for himself. He also engages in interpersonal love, which sometimes comes out as conflict, of course, right? Because, because love, love does involve sometimes calling people to their, to their deepest values and to the values of God in the world. But Jesus does care about people interpersonally. But he, he also works on institutions and structures that are unjust in the public sphere. So, for instance, Jesus goes into the temple and he overturns the tables and he takes a whip of cords and gets kind of a stampede of, of sacrificial animals heading out of the temple, which I'm sure, you know, was kind of a slightly dangerous thing for him to be doing. Um, but he's concerned at that point that there's an institution and kind of structural a problem going on in the people of Israel at that point, um, basically oppressing poor people by making them change their money from Roman currency into Jewish currency, and then buying uh, then buying uh, animals for sacrifice at very very high prices, and this was explicitly using religion to get rich. It was exploiting people and oppressing people through through uh, religious uh, practices. And so Jesus is willing to go into the public sphere, and he is willing to, um, to engage these things, disrupt them so that people can see them. So when we talk about love, we're not just talking about emotion, we're talking about working for the well-being of oneself and all people. And we're not just talking about personal or interpersonal love, we're talking about, about love in institutions and structures. And this is quite important because the domination system that we live in even today, uh, um, works in all four of these areas as well. Um, there, there, we, we can experience um, uh, 
oppression uh, intrapersonally in the way we think about ourselves, we feel about ourselves, we can oppress or be oppressed by others interpersonally. Uh, certainly institutions. Uh, I have a, there's a bank uh, here in Anacortes that, that did not offer a loan uh, to a Muslim family um, after having offered it to them via email. But as soon as they walked in, uh, they weren't, we, we don't give loans to, to, to people like you. You will not be able to receive this loan. We also see structural uh, issues of oppression. And then, of course, uh, today, as we are, are still reflecting on very much the, the death of George Floyd and the eight minutes and 42 seconds that, uh, that, that he experienced um, uh, under the knee of an officer, we are becoming much more aware, I think, as a society of what has been true for a long time that many of the, the structural components of our society, including uh, some, uh, some aspects of policing, have, have in fact been oppressive to people of color. I mean, it's, it's got, uh, just to go back to my own story, my grandfather received 600 acres uh, because of the Homestead Act uh, and when he came to the United States, and, uh, um, but people of color were not allowed to get that land. Um, my father received an FHA loan people of color were not allowed to receive loans that were backed by the federal government. And that means that the structures of our economy were set up in such a way that my family was able to slowly build wealth, even though we went through a bankruptcy, whereas people of color were not able to do so. And that means that when a pandemic comes, uh, my family has a lot more resources. We have some assets, we have some money in the bank, um, we have each other to rely on because I know that if I run out of money, my brother can help me out for a bit or vice versa. A lot of people of color in this country uh, don't have access to those kind of funds because the economic structures were set up to make sure that they didn't get them. And so when Jesus is engaging in love, he's engaging in all four of these quadrants of oppression and liberation simultaneously. He's working on all of them. And so when Jesus, when, when, we, when we are baptized into Christ, of course, in the Lutheran tradition, we don't understand that to be a one-time deal. That's a daily thing, as Martin Luther and the Apostle Paul said, and Jesus himself. Uh, the disciples are those, in my experience, are those who by God's free gift are being daily reoriented in baptism toward God's way of mutuality and out of empire or domination. And it's very important here that I use the word toward. Because, of course, um, I still have the empire uh, and domination system in me. I'm continually recognizing ways in which I buy into attitudinally in terms of my actions, ways in which I benefit from the empire um, that, we're, that we're currently in. Um, but I am being daily reoriented uh, by God's free gift in baptism. Um, away from that and toward God's way of mutuality, I still am a saint and a sinner. And of course, what does this mean for the church? Well, um, the church is the community formed in word and sacrament that is daily reoriented to, participates in, and invites others into God's reign. And, and it must be it must be very clear here about a couple of things. First, uh, you know, Luther's formulation of the church is the community gathered around word and sacrament was really powerful because it it moved it from kind of an institution to the community. But I think sometimes we've reduced Luther's understanding of church a bit too much because I, I've heard plenty of pastors uh, of many different traditions say that as long as we get together for word and sacrament, we're good to go. That's really all God really asks of us. And that's a reduction that I think Luther himself would not have abided by because after all, Luther risked his life <laughs> Uh, you know, to engage uh, a, a system of a church at that point that was acting unjustly, that was itself more of empire and domination uh, than it was of mutuality. And so Luther, Luther's life was in danger because he was willing to risk himself in public leadership. And then we somehow say, well, as long as we get together for word and sacrament, we're good. And so I'd like to propose uh, just a, a little different take on that, just as a corrective to kind of get us back to what Luther really was talking about. The church is the community formed in word and sacrament that is daily reoriented to, participates in, and invites others into God's reign. And of course, we have the freedom to be different this way because uh, of, of 
of God's justifying love. And so let's just, let's just talk about justification just for a second before we go through the slide. So uh, remember, we, we talked about how, how we need meaning. And the culture kind of gives us meaning. But the culture can give us a meaning in a way that kind of controls us or that leads us to engage in systems and patterns of behavior that aren't good for us, for the creation, for others. Um, but we need the meaning so badly that we kind of take it anyway. Uh, because we just need the meaning so bad, and we just can't deal with, with you know, thinking that we don't have meaning. We can't deal with the idea that somebody's going to think that we're doing it wrong, and so therefore we kind of conform to a larger culture that is not working for everyone and isn't uh, living out God's basic value and God's mission statement, which is to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And so here's where justification comes in. Justification basically says that. God loves you so much, so freely, uh, that you are free now. You are free to live out God's value and God's mission statement, even when it's hard, even when it's different from what the larger culture is offering you. So here's the way I would say that more formally. God's justification through Jesus Christ grounds us so deeply in God's love and affirmation of our existence that we are freed from social pressure to conform to unjust attitudes, relational patterns, institutions, and structures. That we are free to be, as Luther said in the Freedom of the Christian, rulers of all subject to none, dutiful servants of all subject to all. So that is the freedom that we're offered, the freedom to fearlessly uh, continue to move from domination into mutuality, and to live out the mission statement of God, the value statement of God, to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. But of course, we don't do that perfectly. And I think there's a lot of times in Lutheran Church when, when, um, when we, we sort of um, think we've got to be perfect, we got to know it all before we can start anything. And of course, uh, the, Luther's uh, and, and Paul's understanding of that we're saints and sinners at the same time is really powerful in this. Um, I, I believe it, it teaches us that we can lead without having to win, uh, to trust without having to be certain, to ask questions without having to have the answers, to try without having to succeed, uh, to begin with, with knowing that uh, we're going to have to learn along the way. Indeed, um, in the work I've done with my Muslim neighbors, um, I, I, after every time we have a public presentation, I always ask, the Muslims that I'm working with, uh, how did I disadvantage you today? And there were times, especially at the beginning, the first 30 times when, when, uh, when they would say, yeah, Terry, you did disadvantage us a bit. And so they knew where my heart was. They knew that I wanted to be a good ally and partner with the Muslim community and to help other Americans and other, other Christians uh, understand their humanity and the beauty of their tradition but I wasn't actually living that out very well, very perfectly, because I live in a culture that is very Islamophobic. And I breathe that in, it's sort of in the air. And leadership as a saint and sinner means I, it's okay for me to be wrong. It's okay for me to learn. So let, let's go back to kind of a central thing. Why, why did Jesus die? Well, Jesus died because he was willing to risk himself uh, to help create a community of people freed up enough in God's radical love for them, freed up enough that they could begin to live out uh, God's way of mutuality in the midst of a domination system and to do so fearlessly. And he modeled that fearlessness, even though he felt fear, right? Even though he felt the pain of it, even though he wanted the cup to pass from him. So Jesus didn't die because God had to beat up Jesus in order to be able to forgive us. Jesus was a leader in the Abrahamic tradition, uh, willing to risk himself to live out God's deep value, God's mission statement in the world, to be a blessing to all the nations of the world, because Jesus saw what would happen when you live by a domination system, that basically everyone's enslaved, the earth gets degraded, 
Human beings are constantly in fear of each other, constantly competing with each other, and never cooperating. And Jesus saw that that wasn't going to work. That's not a way for human beings to thrive and survive in the world. Jesus died because he believed so firmly in God's mission statement to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. He was willing to even bless and forgive the soldiers. Bless and forgive all of those from the cross um, who did what they didn't know or what they were doing. So Jesus died uh, because he was willing to risk in love for all of us. He was willing to sacrifice his life in love so that all of us could recognize God's love for us and have the freedom to begin to live out that love in our own lives and to live out that, that love in, within community. And so Jesus died because he loved God more than tri his tribe and tradition. Jesus was willing to risk his, himself because he loved his neighbor as he loved himself. And so um, Jesus invites us to a, a kind of love, which means that we're, we're called to work for the well-being of our neighbor, in which we don't have to wait to be perfect to love. We don't need the culture's approval to love. We don't, we don't have, to, um, have to depend on the larger culture anymore uh, for our meaning because God gives it to us freely. Um, that we're able to work for our mutual well-being with our neighbor and that we work together for the thriving of life on this planet now and in the future. And so given the environmental crisis that we're also experiencing right now, um, I think we need to add a third uh, to the Abrahamic traditions uh, sort of pair of core teachings. To love God more than our tribe and tradition, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and to add this, to manage the economy equitably within the limits of the ecosystem. Because we are called not only to care for our neighbors who are alive now, we're called to care for our neighbors, including um, our animal and plant neighbors. Um, uh, who will live in the future. So, you know, back to Luther here, uh, Gustav Wingren, uh, when he was talking about Luther's doctrine of just uh, vocation, uh, said that he could summarize it in this way, that God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. So because we've been loved so completely, so radically, so at, at, at the center of our, of our mortal, beautiful lives, um, we are therefore free to love our neighbor. And our neighbors do need our love today, and, and they need us to be able to risk ourselves uh, uh, with them for the blessing and the well-being of the world. Uh, as Luther said in the brief introduction to what to look for and expect in the Gospels, he says, Now when you have Christ as the foundation and chief blessing of your salvation, then the other part follows, that you take him as your example, giving yourself in service to your neighbor, just as you see that Christ has given himself for you. And so we, we live as Christians in this in-between time, between Christ's arrival as the Messiah, we live as the messianic community, uh, moving daily, being daily reoriented in our baptism with one another from a system of domination in which we seek power over each other to a, a way of mutuality in which we seek to have power with each other. Until, uh, until the healing of the world uh, happens. And we understand that every little thing we do between now and then is, is adding to the healing of the world. It's contributing to this ultimate healing that we believe God will bring. Which then, of course, brings me back to my own story. So in my, my Moorish ancestors who were Muslim uh, became refugees at the hand of a Christianity that claimed that uh, at, of a king and queen who were Christian and then got divine blessing from, from the Pope uh, to, to, to subjugate uh, my family. And my family became refugees as the result of that. But I also, on the other side of it, received a benefit from the oppression of indigenous people. As my, my grandfather and great-grandfather got, um, got, um, land that was taken from the Palouse peoples. And, and so my story is very complex. And I, I think that all of our stories are complex. 
we've all benefit, many of us have benefited from, uh, certainly not all of us, but many of us have benefited from, um, from a, a system of domination, which is clearly laid out in that papal bull by Pope Nicholas. That it was okay on the basis of being Christian to dominate and subjugate other people. That, that Christians are supreme. That Christianity is supreme. Um, and there's a, a white Christian supremacy that is laid out in that document that is now, that has been the basis of a lot of the, the white supremacy in this country with kind of our twin sins, uh, twins, twin original sins of slavery, of, of those of African descent, and, and the, the, the theft of land and the, the murder of many indigenous peoples, between 50 and 100 million of them. Uh, something along that line. And so we have a very complex story now, and, and actually in many ways a painful one, um, which again, the, the, the death of, of George Floyd has helped more people to recognize. Um, and, uh, and so what, what do we do with that? What, what do we do? Well, it's, it's really difficult, of course, because we don't want to think that our ancestors did wrong. We don't want to think that we've done wrong. We would like to think that we've earned everything we've gotten. And of course, many of us have worked very, very hard for what we've gotten. But, um, but is that really what, you know, is that really what Jesus came to justify? I don't think Jesus came to justify our sin. In fact, Paul's quite clear about that. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, actually, not at all. Um, what... I think Jesus is offering to us at this moment of great complexity um, of stories that are more, more complex than we've, than we've understood previously, perhaps. Um, what Jesus is giving Christians is, is a, is a, uh, a new, a new opportunity um, to recognize that we are beloved as we are. And therefore we can be wrong. Therefore we can recognize the ways in which, we may or may not have benefited from unjust systems, from institutional and structural racism, and how that has worked itself out in our own attitudes toward ourselves and others, in our own thoughts and minds and attitudes, and how that's worked out in relationship with the other people. That because we've been justified by grace through faith apart from works of law, because we've been loved as we are, we are therefore free to be wrong and we're free to learn. We're free to embrace the, um, the challenging, complex stories of our past. And in doing so, we're able to begin uh, repentance. The, the sad fact is that a lot of our churches and a lot of our church teachings have had far more of Columbus in them than Christ, have had far more of that papal bull in them than of the teachings of the New Testament. And I think all Christians have a lot of work to do to grapple with that. I think in many respects, Christianity has been filtered through white supremacy and white Christian supremacy in this country. And there are many things uh, in, the new in the Christian scripture that we just have discounted or not paid attention to, or have read in a certain way to justify our own behavior. But again, Jesus does not seek to justify our behavior. He seeks to justify us, to tell us that no matter what we have done, no matter what we have benefited from, or not benefited from, no matter what oppression we've experienced, um, no matter what privilege we've experienced, that we are God's beloved and holy children, and that God calls us to the deepest form of meaning we can imagine, to join God in God's mission statement, to live out God's value of being a blessing to all the nations of the world, because that is actually what it means to be human, to be made in the image of God, and to attempt, perhaps imperfectly, always imperfectly, um, to, to join God in God's value of being a blessing to all the nations of the world. And of course, that, that includes being a blessing to ourselves, to our own families, to the people around us. It is okay to have a tribe and a tradition, but it's really important for us to recognize that we're to love the God above the idea of God beyond the idea of God, the creator of all people, and to recognize the humanity of others, and to work for the healing and restoration of this world. 
in the freedom that Jesus offers, that because we've been loved, we therefore have the freedom and the power imperfectly to love. Thank you for listening.